When I do my sermon today, you're going to think I spoke to Tanya beforehand, but I didn't. So, but for me, it's, it's, it's always great to hear from a missionary. And I'm excited that we are sending out missionaries from our church this year. And, my, and one of my prayers as well is that, that as we look at the, the small children growing up in our church, that God will call some of them to be full-time missionaries. And it's, it's what Tanya said is so true. We need to remember that not everyone is called to foreign missions to go, but we are all called to be part of missions. We are all called to reach people with the good news. And you might say that's all good and well, but how am I supposed to reach foreign people? I'm not in contact with foreign people. I'm in Stolby. Everyone looks like me, man. Um, firstly, you're wrong. <laughs> Um, God is shaking up the world. In the past, there was a case where all the Muslims were here, all the Egyptians were here, all the South Africans were here. That's not the case anymore. God is shaking the world, and everyone is everywhere. So even in, in Stilbe, you can go and visit a Chinese guy. You can visit a guy from Senegal. You can visit a guy from Nigeria. God is shaking up the world. But secondly, yes, in Stilbe, the Chinese people will not be our primary mission field. Our primary mission field in Still Bay would be religious people. So what, what are religious people? Well, you get good religion in the Bible. Religion is always, isn't always a bad term in the Bible. But God always explains, he says, no, not like that. True religion is like this. If you read in James, he says, no, it's, it's not your rituals and things. True religion is visiting the, the sick. But by and large, religious people are painted in a bad light, in specifically in the New Testament, but also the Old Testament. It's, there are people who, who like God, and they look like they go, like God externally. They look, if you look at them from the outside, they look like they're people of God. But internally, and this is the main thing, they have no relationship with God. They belong to a, a group, they belong to a church, but God is not alive inside of them. And I need to start out immediately by saying, it's very easy to judge. Very easy for me to stand here and look like I'm throwing rocks at these people I've, I've labeled religious people. But I don't want to do that. And thank you God for giving us your word. So it is not bringing my opinions, but we want to look at what God's word says about this group, the religious people. And and God says things like Matthew 15 verse 8 where he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's people that when the census guy comes to the door and they ask you, you'll say, I'm a Christian. But if that census guy can see your heart, you won't see God there. So what's on the inside and what's on the outside is different. And God uses the term often of them of hypocrites. People faking things. They're wearing a mask. A couple of years back in Pretoria, there was a guy that pitched up and said, he's the crown prince of Liechtenstein. Fancy suit and man. For two weeks, he was treated in, in Pretoria. For two weeks, they took him to all the fancy things. He got to meet the president and everything and all the fancy balls the crown prince of Liechtenstein was taken. And then at one of the functions, the guy says, I know that guy. He's a waiter in Sunnyside. <laughs> and this guy lied about it. He just decided, I will tell you, I'm the crown prince, of, crown prince of Liechtenstein. But he wasn't. And that sadly is how often religious people are. They'll go around and they'll say, I'm a child of God. I can show you my church membership. I can show you my baptism certificate. But if you could look on the inside, God's not there. There's no fire for God inside them. Religious people are best understood when you look at Jesus' life on earth. Jesus arrived in Israel, a very religious nation, a very religious setting. And when he encountered people, they divided into two groups. You had the first group from all stages of life, rich and poor and Pharisees and you name it, everything. And their encounter with God made them say, I want to know this guy. They gave up everything to follow Jesus. 
And they would follow me into the wilderness and they'll follow me everywhere. They put everything behind to know Jesus. But there was a second group. And whenever they encountered Jesus, it made their hearts harder. Because they are in it for religion. They are driven by what they do. So you have the first group that's driven by what God does for them. Or can do for them. And the second group are people that are driven by what I can do to show God how great I am. At one point in, the, in, the, in Jesus dealing with his people, we read in John, that Jesus is speaking to the Jewish leaders. Jewish blood, man. Jew of Jews. Speaking to them. And in Matthew and John 8, they say, now they're telling Jesus, we have one Father, even God. So claiming, how dare you cl- claim to say we are not saved? We have one Father, even God. But Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. You are your Father, the devil. And your will is to do your Father's desires. Here Jesus is blatantly telling them, You have everything. You have the rituals, you have the laws, you have the titles and everything. But it means nothing. Because you are not of God. Um, Religion is when you take God's system and you remove God from the center and you put man in the center. Paul calls this in Timothy, he says, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. How does religiosity start? How does someone end up being a religious person? Many different ways. You can hear about Jesus, and you can decide, I want a part of that, but I'm not really willing to give up myself. I'm not willing to give up me. I'm not willing to give up my dreams and my desires. And then you just take on a little bit, and you take on the religious rules. It could be that you started on fire for God, but life and sins pulled you away, and all that is left is the shell, because you can't lose face now with the people around you. Maybe you were born into a family where your parents were on fire for God. And you're just following in their footsteps. You yourself have no relationship with God. You just follow because your parents are doing it. Or maybe you were born into a religious home. We're all Christians. Of course we are Christian. My parents are Christian. I'm born in a Christian home. I must be a Christian. And it's just a religious thing. In a town like Stillby, there... (laughs) I'm amazed how many wonderful people there are in this town on fire for God. People who give their whole lives for Jesus. But man, it's also a town where religiosity rules. People who will put on their fancy clothes on Sundays and sit in pews waiting for the service to end so they can go back to their normal lives. A life, And they go back to these normal lives that has a completely different way of thinking and doing and speaking than what they faked on the Sunday. What I'm saying now, I'm not saying lightly, but as a child, I grew up in a church that I'm very thankful for because I got saved there. But I remember as a child, as I started reading the Bible and reading about Jesus and reading what Jesus did, and I started looking around at the church that I'm a part of, I realized, you know what, if Jesus had to come today, we'd be the Pharisees. We would be the people who are doing all the religious things. But if I look around at the way we did it, there was no passionate love for God. Often it didn't even matter whether God existed or not. We could still carry on whether God existed or not. We were not looking after the poor. We weren't giving our lives to God. We were just going through the motions. That that shook me. And today we're going to look at a man in the Bible who seemed to have been born into religion. But then he met Jesus and it shook him and he was troubled and he came to speak to Jesus about it. So you can open your Bible to John 3, John 3, John 3, we're going to read from actually beyond verse 8. Let's just pray before we read together. Yes, Lord, our desire is not here today to come and place ourselves on pedestals because we think we're better than other people. Lord, our desire is that you will 
light in us a love for the lost. That you will light in us a love for people who are stuck in a dead religion and they don't know you. Our aim is not here to come and say we're better than them. Our aim is that, to pray that they can have what we have. Lord, you were harsh when you spoke to religious people. I think because your heart hurt for them. That they were so close to the truth, but yet so far. So Lord, as we learn today about bringing your way into a religious setting. We pray that you will make us missionaries here in Still Bay. To bring your truth, your salvation to those who think they have it, but they don't. So Lord, we pray, f- pray all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read and keep your Bible open because we'll discuss it as we read. And we read there in verse 1 from John 3. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. So Nicodemus was a very important guy. He a very religious man. He was a Pharisee, which meant he, he was one of the guys that if he walked in the street, people would go, oh, there's, there's the ultimate religious guy, man. This guy knows it. They were the rulers in the synagogue, and, and, and so people would look up to them. But he wasn't just a Pharisee. He was also a ruler of the Jews, which meant from all these religious people, they gathered together the Sanhedrin. They made the rules, and they ruled Israel as much as Rome allowed. And he was also part of that group. And we, when we read on in John, we also see that he was a teacher of the law. So he was most probably also a scribe. So this guy had all the credentials. I mean, he was religious extraordinaire. Um, let's read on. Verse 2 and 3 says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Most probably to avoid the other religious leaders, most probably because he was ashamed that he felt the need to come and see Jesus. He comes in the night, sneaks around, come to see Jesus. And he comes before Jesus and he makes a statement about Jesus. He says, we, isn't it lovely? Not I. You know, so we, we over there who give you so much grief. Actually, we know you from God. We know no one can do all these signs and these things if they're not from God. And then Jesus answers him in a strange way. It seems like what Jesus is answering is totally unrelated to what he's been saying. And the thing is, Jesus saw his heart. Jesus did answer the question he hasn't asked yet. Because what was going on in Nicodemus' heart is that he realized, we believe in God. We believe we're from God. We believed we are the saved ones. But now you come. And we know you're also from God, and you say we are not saved. You say all the things we are doing is not enough. And now it's got turmoil because one of these two are wrong. Either we're wrong, or you're wrong. And man, we see you from God. Why would you be wrong? And this is the inner turmoil that he brings to, to, to Jesus. And Jesus speaks into that turmoil, and he answers him and says, Your group is wrong. You are wrong. It's not about where you were born. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you have whatever you have in you or what titles you have. That means nothing. And then it's this thing that says, unless you were born again, you will never enter the kingdom of God. An inward change in heart is needed. You have to be born again. So what does it mean to be born again? Well, it firstly means your first birth wasn't good enough. If it has to happen again, it means the first one wasn't good enough. You can't go and stand before God one day and say, I'm a Jew, let me in. No. You can't go and say, well, I'm white and I speak Afrikaans. That must count for something. No. Well, I belong to this church. No. Have you been born again? 
A total change is needed inside of you before you can become a child of God. We read on in verse 4, it says, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So what Jesus has been saying, it sounds ridiculous to Nicodemus. He's saying, must I now go and climb back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus dismisses his attempts. And he starts explaining to him what born again is. And he uses the thing, he says, you need to be born of water and of spirit. Now we go, what does this mean? And you know, over the years there have been many, many interpretations. And people are saying, well, you have to be baptized and you have to be... Or water means the natural birth and that type of thing. But what we know is that this idea of water and spirit must be explained must be must be ex- be explained somewhere in the Old Testament, because he tells him, "You're a teacher of the law; you should know this." So somewhere in the Old Testament, there's a description of what it means to be born of the water and of the spirit. And if we go to Ezekiel, we find it. And I love how it fits in with what Tanya was sharing. It's God comes and says, I will sprinkle clean water in you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statute, statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So what is rebirth? It's an absolute total change that God changes inside you to make you his child. See, the thing is, Nicodemus immediately fell back again to, what must I do now? Must I now climb back into my mother's womb because he's got religion in his mind? What must I do? What must I do? What must I do? God says, no, 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 no. What must God do for you to be his child? What do we already know about rebirth now? It's something that God does. Religion says something I do know. Rebirth is a cleaning and an empowering work that God does in me. And I come out completely different on the other side. You can't say, well, this was me, this was me, this was me. Okay, here I became a Christian and my life just carried on. It's impossible. It's not in line with the Bible. The one guy explained it. He says he, he came late for the meeting. And the guy's like, why are you late, man? You know it's an important meeting. He says, oh, man, sorry. You have to excuse me. On the way here, I was walking, and then my car had a flat tire, and I went out, and I was trying to fix the tire. And as I tried to fix it, the one nut ran into the road. And as I went to pick it up, this huge truck came and drove straight over me. All all the sides, wheels, all came over me, drove over me. and And he says, and he looked at the guy and says, that's impossible. No, 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 this is really what happened. He said, listen. If a truck drove over you today, you will not be able to stand here and explain this to me. How much more if the king of kings come and change you from the inside? How can we be the same? It is impossible to come out from that process of God's renewing work and be the same person. Let's read on in verse 7 from John 3. And it says, Jesus tells him, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The new birth, Jesus tells him, is as mysterious as the wind. You can't explain where it comes from, but you know when it's here. When that wind is pumping your house, you know there is a wind there. There's no doubt that there's a wind there. But to try to trace like a which low pressure caused it where, it's normally impossible. And you can't create it. You can't create the wind. He's still speaking to Nicodemus, who's trying to say, but which, what are the steps now that I must take? You can't force God to do this. This is not a work of man. This is a work of God. The, um, this is now where it becomes problematic. Because if it's a work of God and not a work of me, how do I get it for myself? Is it just a random thing that God comes today and, okay, I'll rebirth you, and I'm going to rebirth you, and I'm going to rebirth you. If I desire this for myself, how can I get born again? 
We jump a bit further in John to understand this to verse 14, where it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And yet Jesus explains to him how new birth and the cross and faith all work together. Jesus' death on the cross made rebirth possible. Before it wasn't even possible. And how does it become a possibility for me? Faith. Only by faith. And the, the, the example he uses here explains it so well for us. Because he's referring to a story that Nicodemus would know. At one time in the wilderness, the Jews again upset God. And he sends serpents, poisonous serpents, to bite them. And what would happen is like, now you're bitten by a serpent and there's nothing you can do to help yourself. And then God tells him, Puts up, put up a stick with a snake on it. And whenever someone is bitten, they must look up to it and they will be healed. And that's what faith is. Faith is saying, I'm looking at my life and there are many problems and I don't know how to fix it. There's nothing I can do. It. I can turn my back on it. And call out to God, to the Son on the cross, and say, save me, help me. And that's how salvation comes. So belief is not just a mental knowledge. It's not just re religious rules I go through. I often explain it like this. to say, knowledge means that I can know that a parachute can carry the weight of a man. That's knowledge. Um, knowledge says I know the, how it works and that type of thing. But faith means putting on that parachute and jumping. Faith says, I stake my life on this. So this is the same thing with salvation and rebirth. It's when I turn to God and say, no more me, but everything for you, that he will do that work of rebirth in you. It's like if a person is drowning. I don't know, hopefully you've never gone through this. But now you're busy drowning in the ocean and now the lifeguard swims out to you. And he gets to you. Now you have a choice. You can try to fight him and climb on top of him so that you don't sink and, and try to do everything. Or he tells, what does he tell you? Just relax. Let me do it. So do you have to do something? You have to do something which is nothing. You have to give over. You've got to trust yourself into the arms of that person. And say, I'm not going to try to keep myself above anymore. I'm not going to try to cling to you anymore. I'm just going to let go and allow you to take control of my whole being. And then let that person swim you out. And when you come to the side, do you jump up and say, You should have seen me, man. I was so great. I was there, just like this. Yeah, man, this guy wouldn't have been able to do it without me. No, that's ridiculous. And that's what salvation is. You can't brag about it afterwards. Yo, man, I had the faith, man. You should have seen the faith I had. Faith is a sign of weakness. It's a sign of giving over myself to a God who is strong and giving everything over. You know what? That's one of the reasons why we don't do altar calls in our church. Because sadly over years, this faith thing has become a fake thing. I just come to the front and I repeat this little prayer after someone. And then I go back to my normal life and yay, I'm saved. I've got my ticket to heaven. This has never been the image in the Bible. The image in the Bible is, yes, of course it includes prayer. But it's someone standing before God and says, I'm giving over. You and you alone. I'm no longer going to be who I was before this. Everything is to you. And in that giving over, this work happens that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about. Where he comes and he washes you. And he puts his spirit inside you. Man, and you know what happens? You have this joy. This joy that no one can take away from you. And you just want to run and jump and scream and tell everyone about it. That's what it means to be born again. Now the question is, is this true of you? Have you been reborn? And if in a message like this, there are different types of people who hear this. Maybe you're sitting here and you have been reborn. And man, you know when someone is reborn. I don't normally like to mention names. But have you ever spoken to Eve where the conversation didn't end up on Jesus? 
it just bubbles out. That's what it means to be reborn. And if you're here today and you are reborn, you need to realize that part of your mission field in Stillby will be people who are not but claim to be Christian. So what do you do about it? I love how Tanya said, tell your story. Tell what God has done in your heart. Live your story in front of them that they can see. You know what? You claim to be a Christian and I claim to be a Christian, but there's something completely different about you. I want me some of that. And you know what? How do you approach someone when you start to get to know them? Don't ask them, are you a Christian? Ask them, have you been reborn? And maybe they don't even understand the term and it gives you the chance to explain this. Has God done that work inside of you? Um, so that is if you have been reborn. First group. Second group. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're listening to all of this and you realize, I'm just a religious person. I'm just here. I don't like to even know why I'm here. It's just the thing I do. And you look at what's on the outside and you look on what's on the inside and it doesn't match. There's no love for God. There's no passion for God. There's no fire for God on the inside. Like I said, we're not going to make you say a little prayer to ease your mind. But I'm going to encourage you to pursue God. Encourage you to spend time with Him and come and speak to me if you need help. But don't leave it there. We're going to see now now when Jesus speaks to religious people. Eternity is at stake here. It's not enough being religious. Religious people will not be saved. But ask about rebirth. Go to God and say, God, I need this inside of me. And now there's a possible third group here. That you have been born again. Man, you were on fire for God. But things have changed. You've slipped back. And you actually look at your life now and you remember the times when you had so much joy. But all you see now is the shell of religion that is left. Jesus speaks to a church in Revelation, Ephesus, and he says, But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. There are many reasons why we slide back. It's often because we allow sin to get a hold of our lives again. We're saying, I'm on fire for God, so I'm very strong, so this little bit won't make a difference in my life. And we open a little door for sin that starts eating away and eating away and eating away until we just have the shell left of religion. And man, if you've once tasted what it means to be born again, it is a terrible place to be. To say, man, I know where I've been. And look what I've allowed now to come of my life. So if this is you today, return. Repent. Do what you did at first. What did you throw out of your life at that time? What did you add to your life at that time? What did you do to show your love for God at that time? Return to where you were. In conclusion, I want to say that the choice between religious and rebirth is not trivial. Eternity is at stake. Do you realize? Jesus spent almost all his time with religious people. Jesus' main mission field was religious people. Because he, know, he knew they think they know God, but they don't. Um, we're going to watch a little video now from the Living Bible where you see God's heart towards these religious people. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, Mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides! You strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. 
blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. You snakes! You brood of vipers! How will you escape being condemned to hell? Why is Jesus so angry about all of this? Because these people have taken something that was supposed to be beautiful. A God who comes to make business with these people. And they took it and they threw God out. And they made a little system that they could live in happily. You see the whole time, inside, outside. You just worry about the outside. You just worry about what people think. The question today is, what's going on in your heart? What's going on in my heart? That's what matters. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to start with ourselves today because it is too easy to find faults in other people. Lord, we want to be born again. We want to be washed anew with your Spirit alive in us. Lord, we want to experience all that you promise for your children. And Lord, we want to pray if there are sins that we are allowing back into our lives that's eating away at this, that you will show us and that we will be able to turn our backs on it, repent again and come anew to you. And Lord, I just want to pray as well that you'll give us a heart for those in this town who are stuck in religion. That you will open doors for us. That we can reach them with your love. That they can understand that it's about the heart. Thank you that you're in the heart business, Lord. Holy Spirit, come and, and make us new. Lord, Holy Spirit, come and, and use us as a church in this town as instruments in your hand. To spread the good news of rebirth. Thank you that you are a good father. We praise you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.